Today is an exciting day. Today is Q&A day. I am flooded with questions nonstop about this studio and about how we operate, how I operate, why I'm doing this YouTube channel. And I picked out some really good ones to answer for you today. But first, I really need to clear something up. I'm about to do a rant about sponsorships in this channel. If you want to skip this and just get straight to the Q&A, here's the time that you can skip to. A lot of people think that the entire purpose of this channel is, is for sponsors. The plug-in versus hardware videos I did, a lot of people think that that is all based on other companies paying me to make that content. I wanna let you know that I will always tell you if something is sponsored or if I received money to tell you something about a product. To date, since I started this channel, the only sponsorship that I have had is through Quiz Tones, which is who sponsors this video. And I always say at the beginning of the video that it's my all time frequency app that I recommend to everybody is because that's actually true. And I remember whenever I used to be an engineer kind of starting out, I was working on cruise ships and we didn't have internet and I was constantly trying to find a way to understand frequencies better. I even went into logic and started like creating tones and trying to guess them and just nothing quite worked out. And then I found Quiz Tones. When I first started using it, I actually plugged it into the eighth inch jack on my phone. At the time we had eighth inch jacks on our iPhones. And I had it going through the house system in the theater that I worked at all the time. And that changed my entire life. Just going through frequencies and practicing and listening, that sponsorship of these videos is like my dream sponsorship because number one it's a product that I believe in number two I've been using it for a long time and number three I seriously have recommended that app hundreds of times anybody that comes up to me and says I want to be an audio engineer I want to get better at mixing I want to whatever I always give them this app and say take this app and just just Every day, do a quiz, every day, like use it and you will get better, I promise. And that's kind of my, uh, my way of seeing if somebody's serious or not. Because there's a lot of people in this world, as I'm sure you know, that, that, that say that they're serious and say they wanna learn, but Quiz Tones is like a perfect tool that will make you better. All you have to do is make that choice and go on there and practice a little bit. And I don't know, it's been my way of seeing if an engineer is actually serious about about learning, about growing, about becoming an engineer because it's an essential skill that you just need uh, when you're an engineer. Okay, done with the sponsorships, done with all that stuff. Now let's get to the actual questions that you guys wanna know. Let's go to the Q&A couch. Q&A time, first question. Do you really mix with analog gear for clients or do you try to stay in the box? So on the YouTube channel, as I'm sure you've noticed, I'm like 95% using analog gear and the console and all that. In a mix with clients, I do the exact same thing. So honestly, there's prop, like in a normal mix session, which has like 48 to 72 tracks, I probably use maybe like 15 plugins in the whole session. Uh, and that's mainly EQ or maybe a delay effect that I don't quite have the gear for. But most of the time, it's just, it's fab filter and maybe an extra compressor here and there whenever I need it. Number two, how to deal with working on projects that you don't enjoy the music overall, but it pays well versus a job that you enjoy working on? This is my favorite question on this list. Sometimes whenever you get a project that you love the style of music, it's like, it's what you listen to anyway. A lot of times, at least for me, I can be way too critical on a project like that. Um, Cause I know the music so well and I, I create these expectations inside of my head on what I want that project to be and how it's gonna kind of compete with other music that I love that's, that's in that genre. And that kind of messes up the focus, at least for me, because to me the focus should be on just that track itself and the client and the artist. Like, it's not my vision, it's their vision of what they want. It's honestly a lot easier to get a project in a genre that you don't listen to all the time, because you can, you can make decisions a lot quicker. As an example, I don't really listen to country music very often, but I, I have mixed a bunch of country songs. Country music in general is a lot easier for me to, to mix because um, I'm not biased at all. Like I can, I can push play and have a completely different perspective 
on what that song is and what it needs and what the client needs versus kind of my own needs and what, what I'm setting up in my brain on what it should be. Hopefully that makes sense. Do you use Pro Tools when you're mastering and mixing? Absolutely. I always use Pro Tools for everything. I'm primarily a mixing engineer, but I do a little bit of mastering and I, I'm never out of Pro Tools. What monitors do you use for playback on the mix? Oh, I, I love this question. Let me, let me show you. All right, so here you can kind of see all the different monitors that I use. We have the Yamaha NS10s here. I never use those, ever. I don't ever turn them on. I know people love them and all that stuff, but for me, I just don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy mixing with those. Um, I'll reference every once in a while. Then we have the Genelec 1031As. This is the second pair that's on the outside. These are like my reference monitors. When it comes to what I'm actually listening to, it's these big guys way up here, way up here in the far, the far field <laughs> monitors. Those are Genelec 1234As. And before we built the studio, I honestly had never used them before. And as soon as I started using them, I just fell in love. They're three-way speakers. Their stereo imaging is, is pristine. Their depth is pristine. There's subs in them, so you get a really good low-end reference. And because they're way up high and the way they're shooting, I can actually roll side to side and still get this mass amount of coverage in order to be able to make those adjustments while I'm at the gear. Of course, everything changes as you move around that, that center image of where the speakers are in that like kind of perfect spot. But just the same as a front of house engineer who when they're mixing a live concert isn't always in the most perfect place to mix a show, they get accustomed to walking around the venue and seeing the differences and being able to spot like, oh, okay, whenever I go really close up front, I have so much more high end and I go back and I lose it all, so let me find that balance. Here's the same thing. When I move to these positions to use the gear to control, the, especially the um, equalizers, I've rolled over there and equalized so many times and came back to the center and check it that I know kind of how it's supposed to sound over there. Of course, I'll check it, but Nowadays, I, I don't ever, I don't have any time where I go over, make an adjustment, come back, and I'm like, ooh, that was terrible, you know? You just kind of get used to it. So I want to show you how big these speakers are just for reference. All right, so you can kind of see that this speaker is more or less half of me, and these weigh a lot. <laughs> it's got the two 10-inch uh, subwoofers here, the mid-driver and the high-driver. We have seven of these in a big circle around the mix position. Uh, set up to be 7.1. The reason I use these speakers primarily is honestly because they translate so well. Before I started using these speakers in this room specifically, I used to go out to the car all the time, I would check reference mixes, I'd check on all these different things, and nowadays, especially because I know how that low end sounds and how it's supposed to be, it translates so well that I've, I've kind of came to the point of trusting those big monitors. What sucks is, is I know I can't carry those around with me, so um, that's where the Genelec 1031A is kind of come in handy. It's interesting, the way those sound compared to the big ones is so similar. Of course, this is a bigger box and it's three-way versus two-way, but but they're, they're very similar. So if you are looking for a good set of monitors, Genelec 1031As, buy them, they're great. Next question. I've noticed you don't seem to use the AAX DSP versions of plugins that are actually able to be DSP, even though you are on an HDX system. Is this by choice or just because you're not really bothered to switch the plugin to DSP? I have found that DSP helps massively to avoid accumulated latency across a large product project. So I have a session that I'm cur currently working on from a client. Since the majority of my mixing is in this analog space and I'm using maybe, I don't know, in terms of gear to plugins, the ratio is probably somewhere in the four to one or five to one, one space. You can see in this session, so this is the band, which I've got like a plug, what is this? I got a snare panning-ish plugin. We got some EQ, transient shaper, you know, stuff that I don't have the gear really for. 
We have, we have a compressor that's a side chain. So yes, if I was more in the box and I was using plugins a whole lot more, I definitely could use that HDX uh, stuff, but I just, I just find myself not using it because I rely so much on the analog hardware. If I was doing a, a mix completely in the box, I'd be using the HDX stuff all the time. It's just kind of rare that I do that nowadays. Next question, why do you use the Oxford drum gate instead of the drum gates on the console? So for drums, I love the Oxford drum gate so much more than a regular gate. The Oxford drum gate is awesome because it's not just, just an overall gate. You can set different frequency ranges to have different release times. The console is just kind of like a typical normal gate. I will use them on other instruments, but in terms of drums, I just, I just really love the Oxford drum gate. So I always, if I need to gate a drum, I go there instead of using the console. How do you deal with effects when printing them down? All on a stereo channel or individual channels? Okay, so I use a lot of outboard effects whenever I'm mixing on this, this giant console. If I didn't have a 96 channel console, I would probably try to sum down my effects into maybe three or four stereo channels. But I basically use this left wing of the entire of the console for all my effects and i have a lot of stuff pre-routed there i probably have there's 24 channels in that bay and i probably use 18 18 of them probably um for effects just just stuff that i could use at any time and, and move stuff around so we're very lucky in this studio in terms of printing things down where every single channel on this console that I have all 96 channels, I have a cor corresponding input to those channels. So whenever I'm done with the mix, I can just print down 96 channels of the mix, everything individual, all the reverbs individual, that way I can come back, route all those stems to their appropriate kind of mix bus gear, and then make those adjustments as needed. A general rule of thumb for me in, in terms of how I use this console is I really like to get anything that's happening in this session to come down to 48 channels. Every once in a while I'll go just past that, but typically I try to stay at 48 channels just to keep everything simple and not just have tons of channels for no reason because so many things can be kind of bust down into, into stereo pairs. And then again that the other 24 channels on the left side of the console is all effects and delays and reverbs and all that. All right, last two questions. I have to read this full question because this person, I'm not gonna say who it was, but they copied and pasted this onto almost every video I have. And I, I, gotta, I gotta put it on here because it's just, it's too good. This is in all capitals. You're a big lad, but you better tell how to achieve this, how to have so much money to buy all this for yourself and have such opportunities. See, in other countries, a lot of equipment, but no one tells how they bought all this. It is very difficult for an ordinary person to buy all this for yourself. Tell us about this. Everyone thinks for some reason that I bought, that I personally paid for this entire construction to be done, all the gear, the console, everything to start a YouTube channel and make videos for, for people. What I used to do was I was a freelancer in audio in general. So I did a lot of musicals, I did a lot of studio work, I did a lot of um, like live shows and concerts and festivals and touring, all that stuff. I also have done a lot of installs on cruise ships, uh, taking out brand new cruise ships, venues, churches, theme parks, it kind of just, <laughs> a lot of install work and design work. So this studio has been here since 2007. Well, about two years ago, they wanted to upgrade everything and make it awesome again. So I got hired as a contractor to come in and help with the digital design of the studio and all the rooms and the networking and all the gear and the the Mac computers and Pro Tools and the, and the networking and all, and all that stuff. And then I collaborated with a studio designer named Danny Stone, he's a great guy. He's, he's an analog genius. And he's the one who designed the room, did the acoustics. He picked out most of the gear. We collaborated on some stuff, but he's the reason why these massive, awesome Genelex are in here and all that. And I kind of came to a place where I sort of, I fell in love with this space that we created. And it was kind of like an opportunity that you never get where it's, it's the dream opportunity of, of make this awesome. Make this studio into something that's unique and that can do anything and that is, is up to date as much as possible and, and all that stuff. 
Uh, so it was a really fun project and time consuming. And after we spent so much time working on this, this, these studios and making them sound and look the way they do, uh, I kind of fell in love with this room and decided to take on this job. So YouTube has two different purposes. One, I wanted to use this space to show people um, a different way to, to mix. I know there's analog mixers on YouTube and stuff like that, but I wanted to bring um, a different viewpoint on, on how these projects are done in a, in a studio like this and kind of give the beh behind the scenes sort of. Um, secondly, I wanted to find more artists that care about this style of mixing using this analog gear. I wanted to create a platform that I could sort of showcase what we do here and what we believe in and hopefully to connect with other artists and engineers, uh, producers that are in sort of the same ideal and the same frame of, frame of mind that we are here. So that's the, the reason why this happened. So no, I do not own any of this stuff. I'm a paid employee and I kind of just wanted to bring you guys along on this journey, um, have some fun and meet new people. At the end of the day, that's, that's basically it. The last and final question. It's that classic like desert island question. What three pieces of gear from the studio, studio would you take with you if you could only have those three? For this question, I'm gonna ignore the obvious stuff like the computer. I'm just gonna assume we have a computer, um, a monitor, a mouse, keyboard, you know, I'm gonna assume we have that. And let me just show you what I would pick. Number one is my Genelec 1031A monitors. Number two, is my beloved Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor. This is gonna sound extreme, but truly, if I had to give away all the 1176s and the tube techs and the 1073s and LA-2As, all that gear over there, if this truly was a desert island situation and the owner was like, go grab three pieces of gear and get out of here. 1031As, Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor, and the Chandler Limited Curve Bender. These are the two things that are on every single mix that I do. They're on the mix bus. I never change their settings. I've just found this magical combination that works for me, and I'm kind of obsessed with it. I just don't think any of this gear that's in here is better than these two things. Yeah, I stand by, I stand by that. That's it, that's a Q&A. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you to everyone for putting in those questions. It was really fun making this one. If you have any other questions at all, throw them down in this video. I'm terrible at getting to comments, but I'm trying to, trying to get better at it. And yeah, just know that above all else, I'm not here for sponsors. I'm not here for any of that stuff. Like I'm here because I love mixing and I love making these videos. I hope you enjoy them and I hope to continue making them for a long time. So thanks so much for watching. I will see you next time, friend.